Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We're in week seven, day two of our life science virtual lessons. I'm Ms. Wilson from Albert Hill Middle School, here to teach you a little bit more life science. And we are learning about LS10 A and B. So when we were here on day one, we got engaged and we did those activities. And now we're going to pick up with day two and we will complete the explain portion. I will give you a deep explanation of LS 10 A and B um, and all the things that we need you to know as your science teachers. And then also you will watch a video on hibernation from BrainPop. And then you'll have the opportunity to do an optional lab and try out your experimental design um, with that portion. And then on day three, when you come back, you'll get a chance to evaluate what you're learning to see if you understand it by playing a Kahoot and also by completing your Legends of Learning playlist. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to this explanation um, of LS10 A and B, which we're calling short-term adaptations. Before we start anything today, I do want you to go ahead and make sure you have your Life Science Student Workbook open, that you're looking at that see, think, and wonder chart, and you're looking over the things that you've typed into it, as well as when we get to the explain portion, you'll need to be taking your notes in there as well. And I'll make sure I talk to you about that. Okay. All right. So with our see, think, and wonder on day one, okay, we watched this video of the Rose of Jericho, our resurrection plant. And in the beginning, it looked like it was deceased. It was all drawn up and dried and brown. And then as the water started to go into it, it turned green, it opened up, it became full, and it started to basically live again. And then here with this picture, you saw the plant leaning towards the window, growing towards something. And hopefully you wonder, what is making this plant grow in this direction? Why is it doing that? Why does it need to? Why is it leaning that way? And then here you have your frog sickles, and that was pretty cool. So that's when you saw the frogs, they were frozen solid like ice cubes, and then they were able to thaw their blood out and just keep on living and swim around like nothing in the world had happened. Um, and they did that to survive that cold winter. If you did your optional bird field observation, you might have noticed that there were more birds out as it got to warmer temperatures in the day than when it was colder. And that's one way that the birds have changed to survive in the temperatures here in Virginia. All right, you also saw these three pictures on day one. You have your hedgehog, super cute. You have this tree here without any leaves and you have these bears. So if you notice, these three organisms do have something in common. They all happen to be organisms that live in Virginia, and they also all happen to be organisms that have figured out a way to survive through the changing seasons of Virginia. And one of those ways is by kind of slowing their lives down and um, looking like they are asleep or dead. So let's talk about what that all means and what these words, what the real terms are for these things that they're doing. Okay, so I mentioned to you a couple of times that this unit is called LS10 A and B, and it's going to discuss short-term adaptations. So what are adaptations and what makes something short-term? So an adaptation um, is when an organism changes so that it can survive better in its ecosystem. Okay, so it's already living there, something happens, and now it needs to change what it's doing so that it has a better chance of living longer. Now, we did learn earlier this year that all living things, despite what kingdom it comes from, bacteria, fungus, protists, animal, plant, doesn't matter, has to be able to respond to stimuli or changes that are happening in the environment. So, these changes that it makes to the things in the environment that help it to survive better could be a short-term change that it's making, so it can survive in that minute or that day, or it could be a long-term change that it's making that may last for several years and it'll stay in that change. Also, some changes are only for a season, like the season of winter or the season of summer if it's too hot and dry. Okay, so let's do a quick example of an adaptation that you are very familiar with, whether you recognize it or not, okay? 
So we live in the state of Virginia and we know that in Virginia, it could actually get cold. Okay. And when it gets cold in Virginia, we don't go outside with our tank tops and our shorts on. Instead, we change what we're doing so that we can survive better in our ecosystem with those different changes, that colder weather. And for us as humans, what do we do? What do we put on to survive better in cold weather in Virginia? I'm sure you guessed it. We put on our coats, we put on snow boots, we put on hats, gloves. We do all of that so that we don't get frostbitten, so that we can try not to get sick and we can survive better in our ecosystem. And so that's an adaptation that we make as humans and other animals and plants also adapt to the changing weather and changing temperature that happens in Virginia in a different way. They don't put on coats, but they do something else, okay? All right, so this week, as I said, we're talking about our short-term changes or adaptations that we make that only last for a, a bit of time. And one of those is called dormancy. So if something is dormant, it's kind of similar to a meeting that it's kind of sleeping one way of looking at it. Um, but organisms become dormant for different reasons. And usually it's all based upon it not having enough of its needs available in its ecosystem. So if it's an animal, that means something's happening where now there's not enough food, there's not enough water, might not be enough air, shelter, or space in its ecosystem. If it's a plant, it might not be enough light or energy source might not be enough air like carbon dioxide available, might not be enough water or nutrients. So when they don't have enough, like there could be a drought that happened and now there aren't enough of the needs or there could be a huge ice storm and now we don't have enough food. So when that happens, the organism is going to adapt. And so when, it's, when dormancy is the choice of adaptation, it's going to slow down its metabolic process. And sometimes it only not only slows it down, it stops it completely, okay? And when I say slow down its metabolic process, I'm talking about slowing down all the processes that the organism needs to stay alive. So earlier this year, you learned about life processes. You learned about digestion, excretion, respiration, photosynthesis, growth, right? So during this time, it's going to slow those processes way, way down or make them stop altogether so that they don't use as much energy to stay alive, okay? So these can be short-term or long-term changes. If you look at this tree, this is an example of a nice hardwood tree, a deciduous tree in the state of Virginia. And our trees, our hardwoods go dormant every year in the fall. Okay, so in the fall, they lose all their leaves, they start to look like they're dead, and that is to prepare for the winter when it's colder, when there isn't as much water available, when there isn't as much sunlight, but they still want to stay alive. So they go dormant, they lose their leaves, and then in the spring, we all know, the leaves start to show up with these little green buds on them, and then you have full-blown leaves, and the plant continues living like nothing went wrong at all. So that is called a short-term change because it really only lasts a season. It really only lasts through the winter. And then they go right back to their normal processes after that. Um, but also, sometimes it can be of a longer term. So in the video, we saw the resurrection plant. We see it here as well. And it did tell us that sometimes they can stay in this dormant phase like this for years. So if you brought the plant home today and you put it in some water, then it would open back up and it would end its dormancy. But if it just stayed in a bag, for example, for five years, six years, seven years, and then you pulled it out, then it still would be able to come out of dormancy. And so we consider that if it takes years to be a long-term change, but because it can also just take a day, then we'll also gonna, we're gonna classify it under the short term for this week. Okay. So animals also can become dormant. They could also undergo dormancy. And so when animals undergo dormancy, we call it hibernation, all right? And so you saw these pictures earlier. You learned about hibernation actually for the first time when you were in elementary school and you talked about hibernation and the bears and how they hibernate here in the state of Virginia. 
So we know that bears and hedgehogs are animals that hibernate. There are lots of others that do hibernate in Virginia. And when that happens, um, it is going to be seasonal for them. It usually only lasts one season, like the season of winter when it's really cold and they don't have enough food and water available to them to carry on their normal lives. And so to prevent dying, they go into this very, very deep, deep sleep that slows their metabolism almost to a complete stop. So they're not, you know, they don't have to um, carry out respiration as much, excretion as much. They're lowering everything down. And so they're almost looking like they are like sleeping or dead, if you see them. Um, and they're doing this to help them stay alive. Um, the same thing is going on with the frogs here, except they're going to actually bring their processes to a complete halt um, and then start them back over again when they thaw out. I did want to mention that um, some the organisms that hibernate are also going to be organisms that don't migrate. So you have lots of choices. Some organisms adapt in a different way and they can just adjust to the cold temperature and they can keep moving around like nothing's wrong. And then some organisms actually migrate and leave and like the birds flying south um, when it's cold in Virginia, and then they return back in the spring. So that's also a different adaptation. Okay, so I'm going to just put a brief pause on this before we watch the Brain Pop video, and I want to look at our student workbook again. Let's see if I can get us on the correct page. All right. So on this page here, this is our short-term adaptations worksheet. We just finished talking about um, the word adaptations, the word dormancy, and the word hibernation. And so there are some questions that um, I'm asking you about each of these things, um, like why do they happen? What types of organisms do they happen in? Um, what are the effects of it? How long does it last? And then I'm also asking you to give an example. So you can either start typing in this now, um, hopefully you've already started. And then also when you watch the hibernation video, you can get some more examples that you can add to this chart. And we'll come back to the chart again in a second. Excuse me. All righty, so we're gonna watch our Brain Pop hibernation video right now. And let's see if I can make sure my volume is not too loud. And we're going to make this full size for you guys. And here we go. Man, it's cold. Whoa. Thanks. Dear Tim and Moby, why do some animals hibernate? From Sunny. In the winter, most animals need to eat more to keep warm. The colder it is, the more energy it takes to maintain their body temperature. Mm. And that energy comes from food. Problem is, food is often harder to find in the winter. Some animals solve this by migrating. That means temporarily moving to a warmer climate. Other animals adapt to the colder weather, changing in some way that lets them survive. They might store up food beforehand, grow thicker fur, mm -hmm. or change their eating habits. And some animals solve the problem by hibernating. No, hibernation isn't just a deep sleep. It's a state of dormancy or lowered body activity that conserves energy. During hibernation, the heart rate goes way down, as low as five beats per minute in some animals. Breathing drops off sharply, too. Some hibernating animals can go an entire hour without taking a single breath. All this reduced activity results in a way lower body temperature that's within a few degrees of the outside air. In a few animals, like the Arctic ground squirrel, the body temperature actually drops below freezing during hibernation. A colder body temperature leads to a lower metabolism. Mm -hmm. That's the process of energy creation that happens inside our cells. Cellular activity slows down, allowing the animal to survive on less energy. So it can make it through the winter with little or no food. Yeah, they do need some energy. 
Before hibernating, many animals spend days or months eating as much as they can to build up fat. This extra fat insulates their bodies against the cold. And during hibernation, they use their stored fat for energy. Of course, animals have to find a good, protected spot where they can remain undisturbed for long periods of time. Some of them hibernate for months and months through the entire winter. Others wake up as often as once a week to get rid of waste or to snack. You may have noticed that the animals we're showing are all kind of small. Most animals that hibernate weigh less than 50 pounds. Rodents, marsupials, fish, snakes, and frogs all include hibernating species. Well, the reason is that smaller animals have a harder time staying warm in cold weather because their bodies have more surface area compared to volume. So that's more places for heat to escape. Well, bears are a little bit different. Their metabolism drops a lot, but their body temperature doesn't fall that much. They can also wake up easily. This state of <laughs> half hibernation is called torpor. Torpor. Oh, and by the way, hibernators don't all live in northern climates. They may not get as cold, but tropical areas have winter too. Well, some hibernating animals detect when it's getting warmer outside. For others, chemical signals in their brain alert them that it's time to emerge. Kind of like an internal alarm clock saying, time to wake up and find some breakfast. Scientists are still looking into exactly how this works. Anyway, my external clock is telling me it's time to head home. I'd like to load up on dinner, then get under the covers and hibernate till morning. It's, it's a figure of speech. <laughs> Alrighty, so good job. We're going to come back here. Oopsies. Okay, so our next type of short-term adaptation that we haven't talked about is called a tropism. So a tropism is when an organism grows towards a stimulus or towards something in its environment. Um, in this case, we have, we're going to talk about plants. So other organisms can't have tropisms. We're going to talk about plants. And so we're going to talk about two things that plants might grow towards. Um, and so one of those is going to be sunlight. Um, we know that plants need sunlight for photosynthesis. And so they will grow towards the sunlight to make sure they have enough light energy um, to stay alive. And so we call this phototropism because photo means light. So they're moving towards the light. This picture right here, the first one where the plant is leaning out the window, it's actually leaning out or growing towards the sunlight to make sure it gets enough light to carry out its processes. And um, if you have houseplants, um, you should know that you actually have to turn them regularly so that they will kind of grow straight up and down in the middle instead of leaning to one side or the other. And then the other type of stimulus that um, plants can grow towards that we're going to turn lock up, that we're going to learn about here in seventh grade is gravity. So gravity also affects the way that plants grow. So this plant here apparently was growing straight up, and then someone knocked the pot over, and so it continued growing outward towards the sides for a little, and then it bent, and the actual leaves started growing towards the sun and then the roots continue to grow downward. So that will always happen. And so we call that gravitropism or geotropism. You can use either term. And it's gonna be because of the force of gravity that the plants are growing in a certain way. And you will learn in high school in biology that there are also other tropisms, but for now we're gonna focus on phototropism when they go towards light and gravitropism or geotropism when they grow because of the force of gravity. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here for a quick second and go back to our workbook. All right, so we do have a row in our workbook that actually asks us about tropisms and what they are and what the two types are that we discussed and give an example. And then also there is a think activity. So this is a little scenario um, that relates to the city of Richmond. We know that it gets cold here. We know that we have animals and plants that live here. So on, by looking at different biological levels um, from the organism all the way up to the ecosystem, how would each level be affected by the changing temperature in Richmond, Virginia? So as the temperature gets colder, 
um, in Virginia, how would a brown bear react to that? One brown bear. Then how would a population of brown bears react to that cold weather, changing temperature? And then how would the entire community of all living things react to the temperature change in Virginia? And then all the way up to the ecosystem, how would the living and non-living factors be affected by the temperature change in Richmond, Virginia? So you can just type a brief explanation for each of those. And then we have a few more things with our short-term adaptations. Making sure you understand what the adaptation is. I gave you a, um, some descriptions here. It says, here's a description column. Um, give an example. Tell whether the example, I'm sorry, is an example of hibernation, dormancy, migration, phototropism, or gravitropism. And that goes in this column here. And then over to the right, you're going to say whether the change that the organism is making is daily. You put a D, seasonal, you put an S, or long term, and you put LT. And that goes over here. And remember that in these worksheets, the light blue boxes are the boxes that you actually need to type a response in, and the white boxes you can leave blank. All right. And then after you're done with that, the next thing is our optional tropisms lab. Okay. So if you did the turning seeds optional lab, you can use the knowledge you gained from there. To help you with this because you should have noticed that no matter which direction those seeds were turned that the roots would bend over and then downward so they were still facing in the correct direction right and then the sprouts that came out of them were still facing upwards and that is because of gravitropism so we learned in our notes that gravity and sunlight affect plants they're both types of tropisms they both make plants grow a certain way so in our experiment here what you need to do is design an experiment that will test the question which tropism, the light or gravity, has the greatest effect on plant, plant growth. So how could you measure that? How could you test that? Um, once you start thinking about it, you're going to go back here and you're going to identify your variables in the scenario, your IV, your DV, what are you going to keep the same? You're going to write out a hypothesis. Which one do you think will have the greatest effect? And then you're going to put a measure on that as far as what you're looking for. And then you're going to come up with a list of materials that you could use to test your hypothesis, even if it's a simulation that you're going to use as your materials. Or if you're going to go back to your gravitropism, your turning seeds lab, and look at some of those materials and just change those a little bit. But now you can test it differently. And then once you're done with your experiment, you're going to take pictures and everything. You're going to run the experiment. And then you're going to use this CER format to see whether you can support your claim with evidence. So if you thought you're going to say which one you thought I made the greatest effect, phototropism or gravitropism, um, you're going to say which one you think would be it. Then you're going to use your evidence from your lab, from the internet, from your notes to, to back that up. And then you are going to, oops, I'm sorry, I lost my page. you're going to reason on your final response, okay? All right, so that is what's happening now. Um, if you didn't get a chance to finish out everything, um, that is what you need to be working on, doing your optional tropisms lab, filling in that short-term adaptations worksheet um, to the best of your ability. And then after that, on day three, when you come back, you're going to complete um, a Kahoot on short-term adaptations. That is pretty great. I look forward to seeing your scores on that and seeing how you did. And then you'll also complete a um, short-term adaptations Legends of Learning playlist that does have a little assessment and also some review games with the terms that you learned this week. So I really, really appreciate you guys being here. I hope that you learned a lot. I hope that you are uh, understanding short-term adaptations, and that you continue to learn more as you finish out this week. Thank you once again, and have a great day.